Okay. Um, yes. So uh, thank you, Ms. Folber, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Caroline. I'm from Germany. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to begin um, our thoughts on um, the presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> on accounting for care. Um, yeah, so this is just the, the usual structure. We're going to quickly summarize um, the readings that we got, then go into our thoughts and some criticism, and then um, end with some open questions and hopefully a very lively discussion. So I'm going to start with um, just quickly summarizing um, chapter one of the reading that we got, which sets the theoretical framework, intersectional political economy. So we already heard this, so this is I'm, I'm going to be quite brief on here. Um, as we heard, intersectional political economy draws on insights from Marxian and feminist theory, as well as um, institutional economics and game theory. So from Marxian theory, we take the notion of um, class struggles that are shaped by collective identities, um, as well as Marxian historical materialism. So the idea that exploitative institutions were set up in order to extract surplus from someone or something. Then feminist theory, of course, highlights the notion that women do have some common interest due to their historical specialization in reproductive activities. Um, and also it highlights that care activities can indeed bridge individual and group welfare. Um, and then finally, we have uh, some references drawn from institutional economics, um, highlighting economic systems as forms of both cooperation and conflict, and then also highlighting structures of collective power. So what are the main tenets of intersectional political economy? Um, as Ms. Folber has said, one key idea is the need to redefine the economy in order to encompass both individual but also social reproduction of group identities and collective interests. Then it also highlights dynamics of cooperations and conflicts. So in the reading, there's this idea that men design, enforce, and defend social institutions that give them economic advantages over women. And um, finally, it highlights obviously intersectionality. So the idea that capitalist institu institutions origin out of this matrix of um, patriarchal, racist, nationalist, and feudal um, overlapping institutions. So um, capitalism and inequalities are based on pre-existing group uh, alliances and pre-existing overlapping inequalities. And then lastly, we also from that chapter wanted to just give some baseline definitions, which will hopefully be helpful for the debate. Um, so what is a patriarchal system? Ms. Fulbo uh, defines it as an institutional structure that shapes the relation between men and women, specifically with regards to reproduction and care. And that line of patriarch is defined as a man who wields power by virtue of his age, sexual orientation and gender. And then a bit more broadly, a hierarchy is seen as a structure of inequality, which can exist also independently of those who occupy this structure. And then capitalism here is a hierarchical structure, um, specifically one that gives power to the owners of wealth over wage earners. Um, okay, I'm going to continue with a short summary of chapter six. Um, it is called patriarchal essence, and it is basically about the fact that um, our understanding of institutional construction of structures of collective power is incomplete, and that we basically need to look at history and understand it in the way that multiple interactions between structures of collective power are based on socially assigned group membership. And that, as we've already seen in the presentation or like heard in the presentation before, patriarchal and authoritarian institutions appear to have co-evolved. So actually, when you look at um, history, as it was also already mentioned, like patriarchal structures already um, emerged way before um, private property of land and livestock and already in gatherer and hunter societies, we can see that um, they were not as cooperative or egalitarian as um, sometimes presented, but that actually there you already had um, 
that you already had violence and theft um, for group success, and that could affect reproductive success. Moreover, male um, specialization in hunting and warfare uh, could have had spillover effects on gender relations and the ability to dominate women. And we also saw see that in pastoral economies that like with privately owned domestic animals, um, the like emergence of that could have facilitated the subordination of women because there was a higher uh, interest or a concentration on private property and paternal investment. And then also with uh, sedentary agriculture, we saw um, increased potentials for surplus, so um, greater wealth. And we saw the link of agriculture and the emergence of extractive institutions. Um, so we saw that economic productivity and military success influenced was influenced by the organization of reproduction. Um, and to the second point of the chapter, hybrid hierarchies, and that is that um, the simple hierarchies based on gender wouldn't have been able to like uh, create such a stable system, basically, um, as we have it, as we have seen it in history and as we have it now, but that there's always these structures of collective um, power um, imposed by subtle and enduring forms of subordination. And there were in the chapter where there were like mentions of slavery, which is like the intersection also of like racism and gender and that basically like, the enslavement of women could have like preceded the enslavement of men and that in patriarchal uh, feudalism we see the intersection of gender and class and how the control over women's sexual and reproductive lives reinforce class-based dominance and vice versa and um, yeah also in patriarchal colonialism we see that colonialism was often reinforced by patriarchal authority and now with like expansion and globalization we see that um, the promise of uh, like just enough prosperity appears to be um, an explanation or like a justification for subordination Okay, that was our uh, short summary. Um, and then we were also asked to criticize or we have some remarks on the two chapters that we wrote. Of course, we didn't write the whole, read the whole book, so it's a bit unfair, I guess. Um, but I think overall, uh, the three of us all in really enjoyed reading the um, two chapters. And I think our criticism is more based on something that we would have like liked to hear more about or like liked some more specification on. And these points are like intersectionality, Marxism and the global South. And I'm gonna start with intersectionality. So I think first what, uh, when we read the paper, um, the two article chapters, um, what got to mind was that there's like a very binary understanding of gender and uh, quite a focus on heterosexuality and the fact that it makes sense when you look at history, but maybe, uh, we would have liked like more elaboration on sexuality and gender identity as this is also like a, one of the, um, like a part of uh, intersectional analysis. And that when we read the um, two chapters, like sometimes um, it appeared like, so intersectionality was missing. And I think it already got like clearer with your, I think in your presentation, it actually got like a lot clearer, but maybe that it was mentioned, but maybe, uh, like the, it was like a bit broad still in the way that I think I would have liked like a bit more of like a way of looking at everything from like a better like intersectional framework and that um, yeah the focus was still a lot on this like one axis of gender and then the examples were like brought in but it would have been or, like I think I would be curious to see if we can like Actually, if we look at, and I think it's also your point, right? But in the chapters, I think it wasn't like super clear that we can't uh, only look on gender, um, or can we only look on gender, or do we already have to incorporate like all of these different identities or like different interlocking inequalities? Okay, so moving to the second critique. So we understand that Marxism is not the focus of the analysis but it is also mentioned as part of the intersectional political economy. 
So we would like to know more about how is the integration of the Marxist theory or the Marxist analysis into this framework. Um, so as, as you mentioned before, the premise is that we can think um, social inequalities, for example, gender, class, and race inequalities as embedded or as a result of the intersection of capitalistic institutions with patriarchal ones. However, we would like to know more about this intersection, about the intersection of these institutions. Um, for example, we wonder how does the economic or material base underlying those institutions, uh, capitalistic institutions, impact or shape social inequalities? Because we can think capitalism as an institution, but uh, it is also a mode of production with an inner material dynamic. So in this, uh, for instance, we have authors like Silvia Federici, Ariel Saleh, and Gurminder Bambra, who have uh, develop uh, social inequalities and exploitation on the basis on the basis of these material structures. For example, Silvia Federici theorized about the unrecognized and the unpaid reproductive labor, which is carried out mainly by women, as you as you mentioned at, at the beginning. And Ariel Saleh, by her part, extended this dependence of capitalism on unpaid labor to the reproduction of nature. And this process, uh, she states, has uh, differentiated social impacts as the ones we can read here, which is the unrecognized contributions of women in sustaining ecosystems and the unique effects of resource access and environmental destruction depending on re gender, race, and class. And finally, Gurminder Bambra, even if she doesn't uh, write about gender inequalities in specifics, she looks at race and colonial dynamics and points out that wealth is a result of the labor and resources of racialized others and colonial subjects. So we think that these perspectives, these material perspectives are not just like ideas or ideologies, but are also features of reality that, that are observable now and through history, through a part of history. So we wonder how to integrate this kind of perspectives into the analysis of intersectional political economy and we think that we, this will also contribute and provide some insights regarding the intersectional part, which my colleague just mentioned was also uh, underdeveloped. Yes, and then finally, we were also interested in hearing more about non-European perspectives on um, the issue of patriarchy or matriarchy. Um, yeah, we, we got a, a subsection in the reading that developed a little bit more on um, non-European origins of patriarchy, but yeah, we were interested in some el elaborations on that. Um, and if we look at European philosophers' idea of what specifically a matriarchy is, then matriarchy is always defined as sort of the opposite to patriarchy. So matriarchy is seen as somewhat primordial and as the step that sort of precedes um, patriarchy in the development ladder. So like we heard in the in the presentation, it's quite sequential and it's quite a binary between patriarchy and matriarchy, whereas matriarchy is always just a mirror reflection um, of patriarchy. So again, in the spirit of rejecting certain binaries, we were wondering what can we learn from non-European forms of matriarchal societies, or did these society exist? What, what can we learn from them? And then one example that we found in the literature is that of um, queen, mo queen mothers in Western Africa, specifically in the country of Ghana. So here the queen mother is um, the senior female of the royal family. And what's interesting is that she holds this title regardless of any relation to a male family member. And she has jurisdiction over an all-female council whose members are appointed by her. Um, and with that council, she actually has governmental authority over the female half of the society. And what we found interesting is that this is a pre-colonial um, matriarchal or matrilineal institutions, but it, in some ways at least, survived um, colonialism and in some shape still exists today. So the picture you see is, um, or at least some members of the Ghanaian Queen Mother platform, um, whose members yeah, are still in, an active interest group in Ghanaian policymaking today. So we were just wondering if you 
had researched um yeah these non-european examples if there's anything that that we can learn from them about patriarchal origins um elsewhere so finally on the basis of our critiques we have three main questions with which we would like to extend the analysis and we also have like a set of sub questions per each so the first one is which other multiples grounds of identity are relevant for gender inequality but class and race are some more relevant than others? How can we form inter-identity alliances? How is the relationship between the institutional layer and the material one in understanding gender, race, class inequalities, and how does the interplay between the two impact the structures of collective power? And what are connected to this, what are the implications for achieving democracy? And finally, what about non-European forms of matriarchal societies? Is patriarchy, can we think patriarchy as a European problem? And that's all. Thank you for, for your attention and for your presentation. Nancy, the floor is yours for answers yeah. before we, we give to the floor. Uh, yeah, great. I'm just trying to take notes on, on uh, the PowerPoints. Uh, yeah. And uh, what happens to the sound has, has gone again. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. But yeah, I'm fine, good. Fine, fine. Uh, I love these comments, and I think they they're all in the spirit of trying to understand the uh, incredible variation and complexity of of kind of of social organization. And I I certainly agree that um, we need to look at uh, non-European contexts, and I do have a chapter in the book where I'm trying to think about colonial, the way in which colonial and gender uh, dynamics uh, interact. I guess, I feel like the, um, just by way of, of an overview, I feel like there's sort of a tendency to pick one, one word or a pair of words to describe uh, what's going on, like, or to describe the world, like capitalism. Well, you can call it racial capitalism, and that implies that you're 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 bringing in one other thing, um, other than class, uh, in it, or you can call it you know colonial colonialist capitalism, or you can call it patriarchal capitalism, or you could call it heterosexual uh, or homophobic capitalism, and I just you know part of the. I think the value of intersectionality is it's saying, look, um, you can't just pair a couple of words and expect that to capture all of the dimensions of inequality that you want. And you need to recognize that um, some dimensions of collective identity are more important in some situations than in others. So I wouldn't say that one ever, that one dimension of, of of identity is more important. It depends on the context. It depends on the 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 technology. It depends on the uh, social structure. It depends on the history. Uh, it depends on the context. I think there have been periods of time in which class conflict has been salient. There are periods of time in which race conflict has been salient. There are you know periods of time and also places uh, where national conflict has been salient and and uh it varies depending on where you are in the world and what level of analysis uh that that you're on so you know i'm not trying to exclude any of these characteristics i'm i'm trying to offer a way of of capturing the complexities that these com comments are pointing to um I would about the uh, heterosexual uh, the issue of sexuality. I think uh, it's true that I didn't say enough about uh, sexuality in the manuscript, but I, I think there is there is more there than in the chapters that you looked at. And I have been very influenced by an early essay by Adrian Rich on patriarchy as compulsory heterosexuality, and I think the pronatalist aspects of patriarchy that I really emphasized are very uh, connected to compulsory heterosexuality and the very, um, very vicious and very 
you know, continuing stigmatization and exploitation of of uh, divergent sexualities is very much a, a, a reflection of those of those patriarchal dynamics. So, uh, you know, I. I'm always trying to look at the interplay between these dimensions rather than to single one out. Um, and I think that means in response to one of the earlier questions, I don't think we can ever focus on gender alone. Anytime we look at gender, we also have to look at differences among women and tensions among women. But I think it, that doesn't mean that we can't try to encourage or, or uh, conceive of alliances and uh, activisms that can reconcile these differences. I think they just, the opportunities for that depend on specific circumstances that um, are, are obviously gonna vary from place to place and time to time. Um, I don't, I don't think that uh, matriarchy is really a very well-developed concept. And I think that what you're describing in uh, looking at cross-cultural examples of it is more of a matrilineal um, situation. Or, you know, in some cases, there there are some societies that are more than matrilineal. That is, more they do more than just define kinship in terms of the the female lineage. They they give women uh, rights to um, property for instance, that a lot of patrilineal society, I mean, in many ways, patrilineal societies were patrilineal, not just because of the way they defined kinship, but because of the way property was inherited. So there are examples from all over the world, uh, in, in both in the global south and in the global north of societies that little groups, often kind of marginalized groups or, or groups that were kind of isolated, that managed to sustain more egalitarian and matrilineal um, uh, and it, access to property uh, to women. And I think most of those are kind of the leftovers or the survivors of pre-existing egalitarian societies, which I think were scattered uh, it, it, you know, in many places. In the US, the Iroquois, Native Americans known as the Iroquois had a famous system of democracy in which uh, women played uh, a hugely important role. So I think there's there's just this wonderful scope for ethnographic research um, about varieties of uh, hierarchy and inequality. Uh, I, I definitely don't would don't think one can argue that patriarchy is a European problem. I think uh, um, You know, if if you look at the tradition of Confucian uh, uh, institutions in China, and even look at, at modern policies in China, uh, they are, are are very much a manifestation of patriarchal power. Uh, if you look at uh, the position of women in India and its interaction with the caste system, you can really see how control over women is basically what made it possible for caste to be inherited. You know, making it very dangerous for men and women to marry outside of their caste was really key to the reproduction of, uh, of the of the caste system. So I think they're just these wonderful opportunities for thinking about uh, how these how these things all come together. And you know, as I think I said, I I do really value the social reproduction vein of of Marxist feminism, and I, I've learned a lot from it, and I identify with it in many respects. But I see in it a reluctance to think about patriarchy, or to even use the word patriarchal. And um, I think you know Sylvia Federici is a brilliant writer in her description of organized violence against women during the witch trials in Europe. But she attributes this to capitalism in an era when. Very few people would agree that uh, 13th century Europe uh, or 14th century Europe could be described as 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 capitalist, and 
she never considers the possibility that men as a group derived some benefits uh, from patriarchal institutions. It's the, the tendency in the Marxian literature is to say that capitalists made them do it. Capitalists orchestrated it. Capitalists put them in a position where, where they had to do this. It's it's kind of this absolution of any responsibility from any political group other than uh, the the class elite. And I I think, you know, if I just think it's not it it doesn't explain the world today. You know, if if the global if if you look at the concentration of wealth on the global level, you know, the global, the top 1% of global wealth holders is a tiny group that controls a huge amount of the, the total resources. That could never happen if people weren't, weren't divided by their nationality and their race and their gender. There would be an immediate expropriation of a tiny elite that completely controls wealth were it not for an elaborate structure of co-optation and cooperation in the existence and perpetuation of other inequalities. Or at least that's that's my view. Um, so I hope you can see the political urgency of what I'm, you know, of what I'm saying, uh, because it's, what I'm saying is if, the only way to build a class coalition to redistribute global wealth and develop a sustainable economic system is to acknowledge and overcome other forms of inequality and difference that impede uh, the kind of coalition that's needed. That's all for now. <laughs> Hello. Uh... I'm I, I'm Bjarne. I'm from Germany. Um, I have uh, um, I have a question that I think about a lot, and I never got a satisfying answer so far. Um, <clears throat> and I I wanted to ask about uh, or to preface this a little bit. So uh, when we look at the class struggle, then a big part of how the working class was able to uh, gain some or or use their power. Uh, to gain more privileges or or fight the privileges of the capitalist class was using the the strike, right? Um, oh. Which is a very important tool. And now I'm thinking uh, when uh, it comes to a similar struggle of uh, caregivers or or women um, against uh, people that uh, exploit this, then we have a little bit of a different dynamic where it's not just like a, a two classes but in the care case there is also like a third class of people that are reliant on care um that are kind of somewhat um um somewhat innocent uh, third party i would say oh. especially if we look at uh, elderly care which is what how i thought about the case now and here the strike seems a bit unfit to solve uh, this struggle because often uh, then women or caregivers are taken emotionally hostage because if they strike, yeah, if course, they yes. uh, refuse to uh, give care, right. then it is not, it is first and foremost this innocent third party that suffers. So how can we overcome this this weird gridlock, this hostage yeah, situation? Yeah, that's a great, I think that that's a very good question. And I this is one of the reasons why specialization and care provision reduces bargaining power is that care providers become prisoners of love. Uh, okay, so for instance, this is one of the reasons why I think women were more easily enslaved than men because women uh, who were impregnated by their captors felt a commitment for their offspring that limited their ability to resist or fight back. You could always threaten to kill a woman's child and uh, gain her submission. I mean, that is that that is part of the dynamic. But, you know, there are a lot of ways in which uh, caregivers can exercise bargaining power. And one way is just simply uh, not, not engaging in or not committing to uh, caring relationships and fertility decline is a major factor and below replacement fertility 
in Europe and elsewhere is really increasing women's bargaining power in terms of state provision um, for for public policy. But I, I think there's also this, yeah, I, I, I think what you've raised is a really complicated question, but I guess I still believe that um, On a personal level, people are quite appreciative of the care they've received and eager themselves to provide care. And I think people have a kind of stake in what I would call a sustainable care economy for personal reasons. Like you wanna live in a world where people are nice to each other, right? So I think that uh, that's why I think that emphasizing the kind of, so effective care provision on the social climate that affects everybody it is a, a, a really important tool to show that, look, um, you may gain, it's a little bit like the conversation about climate change where people kind of recognize, excuse me, people recognize, oh, this could be a problem, right? but I'm not gonna pay for it. Uh, uh, you know, I don't have to deal with it. Uh, it's not my problem, right? Uh, well, the care problem is just like that. And in both cases, you have to really, really show much more persuasively, look, this really is your problem. This really is gonna lead to deterioration of things that you hold dear, that's gonna affect the way you and your children and your friends and your neighbors are gonna live and I I think I think that's why academic research on these issues is so important is because I think it can help make that point uh yeah hello uh, my name is Max I'm also from Germany and I had one question on the um interplay or like the connection between racism and capitalism in particular because mm -hmm. like i agree with you that that patriarchy is much older than capitalism precedes it and uh, there are like a lot of factors that explain it like i don't know going to a, a farmer society from hunter gatherers and so on but racism particularly seems to me like a modern phenomenon which like uh, developed in conjunction with capitalism uh, to to like justify and um and uh, to 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 like yourselves and others why uh, it makes sense to like exploit these people and 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 like racism in its modern form was not known to the ancients was not known to medieval people and it was only like uh, in the development of capitalism that it arose so would you say that that is like in the last instance it's economically determined or it's just a way to like divide people uh, and exercise power regardless of the economic system yeah, I, I just don't agree with the, I, I guess a lot depends on what you call racism. I mean, racism as a elaborate theory of the quote unquote physical and social inferiority of particular races. Yeah, that is a modern phenomenon. It's associated with, with, with kind of, you know, scientific racism, but racism in terms of loyalty to the in-group and stigmatization of outsiders as barbarians or you know uncivilized or unworthy of respect or or treatment or you know vulnerable to slavery that has very ancient origins uh it has origins in i mean you can look at the at the hebrew bible uh and and the the conflicts that took place there about the identity of uh, you know the persecution of the jewish people which begins at a very early stage is, is a form of ethnic racism. Uh, it's, 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 it's not identified purely as a religion. It's seen as something that's inherited, right? So, uh, I mean, racism has changed and morphed into something really uh, distinctive under capitalism, but I don't think it originates with it. Okay, and just a quick second question, like especially on the topic uh, on the on the term of reproduction, uh, because 
like uh, now under uh, you know like ecological collapse a lot of people are arguing that when we talk about reproduction we ha also have to take into account the reproduction of ecosystems and the reproduction of like non-human living beings and yeah. uh, do you think that's like a helpful concept also like for political struggle or should we like keep our focus on humans <laughs> thanks I I'd kind of be interested to know your opinion on that Well, yes, I, I, mean... I find it I see that because I find it very difficult. Uh, I mean, I think it should we should we should care. I think care provision should extend beyond the human. But I think it's also a, a kind of difficult political strategy question um, that I'm a little bit torn by. So yeah, it's, it's like what... the, the the word production that like uh, may, um... Uh, that mobilizes people a lot, right? To say, okay, we need to take over production, we need to distribute the output a bit more fairly, that mobilizes people, but to talk about the conditions of production or like how to mobilize people to take more care about reproduction, that 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 garners you a lot of like uh, wondered uh, looks and okay, uh, what, do we, what exactly are we struggling for here in this case, right? I, I, I mean, I find, I find it difficult to well, it's an, uh, it's a it's a new idea. It's a new yeah. it's a new idea that it it's not just something you can take for granted and then expect it will happen, but that it's actually has to be problematized. But I think that's what this discussion is all about: is trying to trying to problematize it in ways that make people more aware of it as a dimension of of collective engagement. Hello, my name is Akhror. I'm from Tajikistan. I'm from patriarchal society. So uh, my question is, uh, so I'm trying to understand the balance between uh, patriarchal society and the society we witness in Europe, where in Europe it is developed country, it has lots of resources and it gives a lot of opportunities for women, like financial freedom and etc. But uh, for example, in my country, you don't have that. So and then how would you then find the balance for women to be feminists or having their own voice? Because in my country, it is usually women are thought like they are, I don't know, they are here to give birth, have kids, um, and uh, and get married and etc. So even if we have women society who have been westernized and who have been introduced to the idea of feminism etc but still um, they feel kind of lost when they come back to the society so I mean they're like they have been brought up like for 25 years with the formula and then they come back but the thing is they don't have enough they are not equipped with the tools to face the huge amount of discrimination and etc., or the level of uh, the lack of economic opportunities back home, and then how would you, since you were talking about global global styles, how would you, um, yeah, how would you, I don't know, change that society or so, yeah. Well, I. I mean, because, first of all, be, be, because uh, in my country, for example, this this idea is viewed so negatively. So it is something Western that has brought up to change the society, the yeah, of course. DNA of the society, yeah. which, which in my country, they don't want to change. They want it to stay. And it's viewed as it is here to destabilize the country. Or, yeah. yes. And, um, and here in Europe, uh, there is an observation that yes, because we won't have freedom and have financial resources, uh, seems like there is an engineering of the marriage, and uh, and where is then the love stories? Uh, well, in my culture, yes, we don't have all the resources, but they are committed to marriage because they love and etc. They don't care about about the rest about the human rights, et cetera. But in Europe, it's more like not about the right, but it's about the contract that you make to the partner and finding the best, uh, uh, how to say, best maximizing 
optimizing your value in the marriage let's say it's like keeping a big accounting sheet cost and benefits and then so thank you yeah let me um let me respond because i think that everything that you're saying is really important to try to better understand but you know first of all we all have patriarchal histories. Europe had patriarchal institutions that were very similar to the ones that you describe. And instead of interpreting patriarchal institutions as something that's, you know, oh, these are bad and and over here they're the good societies, I think we want to say, see, look, they evolve for a reason. They solve a problem for a society. They help hold a society together, but they change in response to technological and social change, the systems evolve and making people more aware of the way that they evolve um, and the potential to, to actually influence the way they evolve, to design, you know, to, to improve them is really important. And It's it, it's one of the things that I think is really interesting about modern capitalist societies is that on the one hand, they've given women more rights, but on the other hand, they provide very little encouragement for family or community commitment. And so we've gained a lot in that transition, but we've also lost a lot. So then to me, that's what socialism is about is trying to have a society that values family and community and is also able to meet people's economic needs and encourage creativity and innovation and uh that's our you know that's our task um hello my name is Karen. and i'm from austria first of all thank you very much for presentation is it's really a privilege to hear you speak uh my question is more uh regarded to the movement in economics to actually focus a bit more on care and what you've talked about and in particular about modeling like if models now also incorporate uh care and the care economy but also imputing care into gdp calculations because as you also mentioned there's a lot of critique yeah. but also everybody's very happy about it but again there's a lot of critique should you even do it and how to do it so i was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit more thank you maybe we can collect two two or three questions together okay and then i come back um hello yeah i'm nina i'm from the uk uh mine's quite actually a similar to question to what Kara said and it's kind of the um involving the value of care work oh sorry involving the value of care work and ecological aspects into popular thought and can this achieved solely through can this be achieved solely through like a monetary evaluation of care work and environmental issues into system of national accounts does this then fall on the government for example in a lot of oecd countries uh care work is uh and teachers for example are paid predominantly through the government is this then a um incitement of the government control over valuation of things and how and yeah i don't know if i'm articulating myself well enough but is um how can we adapt the idea of value of care and ecological issues into popular thought and is this the role of the government or is this the role of activists, for example? Okay, let me let me go with that. I mean, I I this is my current project is thinking more about the history and the future of efforts to assign a monetary value to unpaid work. And I think um it's important to uh to proceed with the kind of satellite account approach and the redefinition of gross domestic product that's underway. But it's also really important to warn that monetary values based on market values will never capture what we're talking about because what we're emphasizing is the public benefits 
of, of care provision. And I think what we need really need is more research showing how um, care provision affects our social ecology. Like how does better care provision uh, reduce mental illness? How does it improve physical health? How does it contribute to problem solving of the natural environment? In other words, thinking more about uh, uh, the corrosive ways in which inequality and lack of care really impose social costs on us all. That's very different than saying, you know, oh, if you spend an hour cooking, we can assign that the value of a cook's hourly wage and add it into GDP, right? It's a much more ambitious uh, agenda. And that's what I think we should be pushing for. So, it, and then the the other question, you, you know, I, I hate the idea of distinguishing government from activism. Ideally, activists should be the ones really shaping government and really shaping government policy. And I do think public policy should ensure that caregivers get more support and reward than the market gives them. I don't think the market can ever adequately reward care because care can't be priced on a per unit basis, right? So I do think the public sector needs to address it, but it needs to address it through a democratic dialogue that's really in which activists play a really important role for sure. Hi, I'm waiting for the camera. I look great today. Hi, I'm Linda. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, thank you for your talk. This is, uh, for me, what are the highlights of this program so far? Um, I was interested in what you said about collective mobilization being successful in the past, because I find it always kind of baffling to realize that they managed to make uh, personal conditions political as a category. And I've been doing a lot of research into consciousness raising recently, um, and I'm wondering if you could reflect on what we could learn as intersectional activists from the kind of bridges that were built back then, because I think it, it could have been a lot better uh, because, well, feminism, when it became, was overly white, but it did manage to change a sort of cultural conscience uh, started by a few activists. So I'm, I'm wondering strategy-wise if you could reflect on that. I wish I um, could draw uh, maybe, some maybe very... If, if, if you don't mind, we take two or three questions so that okay, you okay. can... Uh, okay. Uh, yes, yes. Hello, my name is Dario. I'm from Italy. Thank you again for your presentation. Uh, my question is related to one of the critiques that sometimes comes from the from the right wing to uh, progress, progressist and mm, intersectional movements. And it's about religion. So what really, what role should have religion in that socialism you were talking about? Uh, in the sense that most religions historically at least have been at least used if it's if not structurally a tool of oppression or of justification of so 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 society so, so, society roles and care roles uh, of women's for example um but on the other hand when we think about secular societies often we do it from a very western perspective uh so like this this idea of religionless and religion free uh societies are yeah, are more. I think that sometimes what the Western world tries to um, impose on on the rest of the world. Uh, do you think that religion should have a role, or we should be all going for secularism? Still two questions, and then we'll take another round. Um, hello, I am Yaksh. I'm from India. Uh, my question is actually somewhat related to what Aror had said earlier, but I was wondering if you could 
say something about kind of the interaction between feminism in the global north and feminism in the global south because uh, a large part of this interaction is kind of it develops into these echo chambers where the global north kind of has one narrative towards uh, feminism and a lot of people who actually try to uh, for example, myself, I am studying in Europe and I had a very good bachelor's degree, which is also kind of uh, a privilege uh, in, in a southern society. Uh, but there is very little intermixing between uh, people who actually do end up leaving southern societies and getting educated in the north, having better ideas and and knowing more about what a better life could look like, for example and the backlash that they kind of face when they move back home, uh, the difficulty of integrating these ideas into societies and the smaller possibility of incremental change. Um, I was wondering if you could say something about this, because I mean, this is a question that I have been thinking about for a while, uh, now that the program is coming to an end and the yeah. prospect of going back home kind of shows its face, but uh, it's something to think about. Thank you. Yeah. Fine. Hello, my name is Gabriel from Brazil. Uh, my question is, you, you mentioned in one of the slides about uh, removing the idea of exploit, oh, broadening the idea of exploitation to unfairness in general. And I kept thinking that in, in Marx, there is a vague idea of justice. And once you move exploitation to the idea of unfairness, do we need an idea of what kind of justice are we looking for? How can we think about fairness in, in, in your vision? That's my question. Okay, so I leave okay. you the floor and we have some other questions, but <laughs> Yes, thinking about justice and thinking about human rights has to be really at, at the top of the agenda, political agenda, I think. Um, you know, there's, There's a wonderful parable that Amartya Sen tells. I may not get this completely right, but it's it's called the story of the flute. Um, and it, he's describing a village in which um, a, a flute becomes available and the people are trying to decide which child, all the children want the flute and they're trying to decide which child should get the flute. You know, should it be... Um, the child that's the best musician or that has the most musical talent? Should it be the child who who made the flute uh, in the first place? Should the fact that of, of creation, would it be it would, would it be fair to give the flute to the person who created it? or or would it be fair to give the flute to the child that needs it the most, that's mo the most deprived in other ways? And I think what Sen, was getting at with that parable was that there's no easy answer and the definition of justice and fair play is something that we have to work out among ourselves again and again and over and over and it will it will never be easy um and i think that's one of the reasons thinking about uh you know basic concepts like justice and, and human rights is is really crucial um I, I think the uh, one of the most positive aspects of the current academic environment, global academic environment, is that it's become more international. And your your program really represents that in a particularly concentrated form. But it's also true that for, for me in my career in a in a U.S. university. I've seen our intellectual discourse become more and more international. And I think it's such a rich and important event of, of cross-fertilization and mutual understanding, but it's also very, very stressful um, and very, very difficult um, because it just, the very process of kind of creating a new in-group of fellow academics and fellow researchers in a particular area um, imply creates conflicts with other aspects of identity to your community, where you came from, who you care about, who you're going to connect with, that are really difficult to negotiate. But 
I just want to say that the one of the best experiences of my entire intellectual career has been being involved with the International Association for Feminist Economics that brought together very, very explicitly, as much as possible, scholars from the global south to be in dialogue with those uh, elsewhere. And I think it's really been a, um, I really, I really, I really believe in the importance of that dialogue, despite the difficulties um, that it creates. And, you know, maybe this relates to the question about religion, I guess, you know, who knows, I'm not really sure exactly how we should define religion. But however we define it, I think we need to recreate it in new ways. And um, that uh, religious beliefs and religious organizations have very much reflected the circumstances and the hierarchies of the societies in which they emerged. And as we come to understand those better, I think we can also move towards a better understanding of spiritual and moral concerns that um, are clearly vital to our mutual um, happiness and well being as a, a species. Maybe I guess I'm thinking like, is there not such a thing as a secular religion instead of, instead of contrasting the secular and the religious, I think maybe we want to say, look, you can't have a society in which people make all their decisions on the basis of calculating costs and benefits. It requires some commitments and intrinsic values that cannot be abrogated by um, instrumental thinking, right? And that in turn is the answer, I think, to the question about how movements emerge and how they how they persevere they don't movements cannot persist if they only think about their odds of success or about the cost of participation they can only persist if people are moved by them and committed to them and persistent to them and impelled to be creative about them um, and i think that's something you know that is an aspect of our being in the world that has been really kind of crippled by economic, conventional economic thinking. Um, hi, I'm Sonja from Germany, and I would like to come back to one specific issue that you raised in your presentation. Um, because when looking at unpaid care work and specifically how we can look at it through uh, a social reproduction theory lens with some colleagues here, we find it quite difficult to distinguish the different ways in which this term was employed, um, which you already talked about, because it seems that it has really been embraced and maybe to a certain degree corrupted by quite mainstream institutions and scholars recently. Um, that use it to talk about the reproduction of human capital mostly. Um, but of course, of course, at the same time, there's much more radical approaches which form a very important basis for feminist struggles. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on how we can rethink a concept of or maybe even a theory of social reproduction which aims to um, transcend this understanding of only replenishing labor power and maybe what are the preconditions for social reproduction that does not necessarily um, reproduce capitalism at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, And the second and last question. Hello, so my name is Stefan and I'm from Denmark. And that's going to play a little bit of a role here because we're going to talk about this about the welfare state because in my country of course um, we don't really have the same amount of unpaid uh, care work as is apparent in this room but that sort of led to a counter reaction with a uh, with much of the feminist movement in my country because they of course held high the fan of like equal access to work equal pay and that was uh, what they fought for for many years but uh, now they're actually uh, want to work less and they feel like they've been removed and distanced from their family. And now they feel like, because the argument was this exploitation argument, like if we give them 
the ability to have a, a care through the government for the kids and such, then they will be able to work and produce. And this was like the economical viable argument that was uh, that was formed so that we created the society that we have. And that's perfectly fine. But now they're in the situation where a lot of people are kind of aware of this and they want their free time. They want to be at home. And this is not just the females, but this is also the males of my country. So the question is, isn't it a little bit of a paradox? Isn't it a little bit of a conundrum? I mean, if we if we, if we, if we remove the no, care I, of the children I, and the I, family to the state, then you know, then in the then you're just working and then paying somebody else to do something that might you might actually prefer to do in the end of the day when like realism strikes and you're actually doing the nine to five is, office job. But this is the whole point of of a uh, of the of thinking about care provision and the importance of it is to say, look, uh, it's really important uh, and just just because it takes place outside of wage employment or outside of kind of the realm of of the capitalist market doesn't mean that it's not absolutely crucial and that it's not also an important part of our you know our expression as people right i mean i think this this is that what you're talking about is the contradictions of capitalism that defined liberation as being able to work outside the home well guess what that you know that's not what people want. What people want is to be able to combine a commitment to their friends and their families and their communities with a decent living. And the decent living part, Denmark and other countries do pretty well in terms of per capita income, but people are struggling to find a better balance between, um, you know, different kinds of work and different ways of being. And I think that's a healthy and and productive adventure um, that's that's underway rather than a, a, a contradiction. And it, it does challenge sort of conventional ways of thinking about um, quote unquote progress, right? Maybe we want less money and more time. Um, but that kind of fits in to me, in my view, that it, it's very complementary to thinking about the 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 ecological need for um, a sustainable development that's not based on producing more and more things for more and more people, but realigning our priorities towards uh, more sustainable forms of consumption that involve more 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 time. Or time for ourselves, and and fewer gadgets. Um, so I see some convergence there, I guess. But I don't mean to make it sound like it's easy. It's a it's a process that we're all tr trying, and er in every parts of the, part of the world, people are trying to figure this out in different ways, right? And our job as thinkers is t is to think about it, right? Um, I, I don't know. I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, the question about social reproduction. I'm not really sure what the what the best way to think about it is. I guess I I worry sometimes that the reproduction word makes it makes people think too much about um, child rearing when actually the, what we're talking about is something much bigger and broader than that. And I I really like the term social climate, improving the social climate, uh, making creating a sustainable and efficient an equitable social climate because it gets away from that reproduction word. But on the other hand, I also care about the, I, I guess I'm just saying I'm kind of torn and I don't really know, I don't really know what the best path forward is, which is why I spend time talking to people like you about it. Um, and I also don't really know the, in response to the fir the first question in this series. I don't really know the the um, what what makes social movements uh, succeed other than just sheer uh, uh, willpower and and creativity and um, talking, 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 thinking, thinking, thinking. So that's what I'd like to leave you with: talk more, think more, write more, read more. That's this our is job. A good final word. Thank you very much, Nancy. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs>